Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I am the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. I want to acknowledge the challenging circumstances that still remain, even as our spaces begin to open up and expand. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in recognizing and condemning white supremacy and the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Andre Hill, Dante Wright, and Micaiah Bryant. We grieve for so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of state-sanctioned violence, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that MOAD's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names, to hold space, and honor these victims. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and thank the Ramatush and Chechenyu Onloni peoples of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and continue to do so. Today, I wanna to welcome you to MOAD Online and to our series, Conversations Across the Diaspora with host Sarah Ladipo Manika. I wanna thank everyone here who has joined us with special appreciation for those who have donated to the museum during this pandemic. We would not be able to produce this programming without your support. Today, we are thrilled to be presenting in partnership with the San Francisco Public Library, a conversation with Nobel laureate, author, playwright, poet, and political activist, Wale Shoyinka. I will introduce our host and she will have the honor of introducing our esteemed guest. Sarah Ladipo Manika was raised in Nigeria and has lived in Kenya, France, Zimbabwe, and England. Sarah is a novelist, short story writer, essayist, and founding books editor for Aussie.com. Her debut novel, Independence, is an international bestseller, while her second novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, has been translated into a number of languages. Her nonfiction includes personal essays and intimate profiles of people she meets, from Mrs. Harris, and Pastor Evan Mawarire to Toni Morrison and Michelle Obama. Sarah previously served on MOAD's board and currently serves as board director for the Women's Writing Residency, Hedgebrook. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Ladipo Manika. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you, MOAD, for hosting this series. Thank you to all of you who are in the audience or who will be listening or watching this later. Above all, a huge thanks to Professor Wale Shoyinka, who I will introduce now. Wale Shoyinka was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1986. Born in Abeikuta, Nigeria in 1934, he is a novelist, playwright, poet, and biographer. His prolific body of work spans more than 40 works, including The Interpreters, his debut novel published in 1965, Death and the King's Horseman, a play first performed in 1976, and Ake, a beautiful childhood memoir, and one of many great autobiographical works. Most recently, Shoinka has written his third novel, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth. Shoinka is also a political activist who was twice jailed in Nigeria for his criticism of the Nigerian government. One of these imprisonments included a year and 10 months in solitary confinement, which he has written about in his book, The Man Died, Prison Notes of Wale Shoinka. In 2016, Shoinka famously destroyed his US green card when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. As an academic and professor of comparative literature, Shoinka continues to lecture extensively within Nigeria and internationally. He currently holds positions 
as Professor Emeritus at Obafemi Awolowo University, a Hutchins Fellow at Harvard University, and an Honorary Fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge. Shoenka is active within numerous artistic, academic, and human rights organizations, including the International Theater Institute, UNESCO, and the International Parliament of Writers. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Shoenka is the recipient of numerous academic and national honors. Professor Shoenka, welcome. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Thank you. And we know it is late where you are. So a double thank you for just being with us. And we know that you're running around doing so many things as this new novel has come out. So there is so much to cover in a short space of time. We want to talk about you. We want to talk about your works, Nigeria and the world at large. But I thought I would start with you. And because we are in the context of a museum, the Museum of the African Diaspora here in San Francisco, where I am located at the moment, I thought I would start with a story about you. This is a story that I've heard, and it's also a story that you've written about in one of your memoirs, You Must Set Forth at Dawn. And the story begins as follows. Once upon a time, Wale Shoyinka partook of a transatlantic heist, which involved the stealing of a piece of art. Can you tell us a little bit about this story and what this story tells us about the person that you are? You know, that word seal, I don't like it. I went to recover uh, the property of my own people, one that has enormous historical significance, uh, spiritual significance, contemporary socio-political significance, but what matters is that the history about the disappearance of this piece of art has always been fraught with lots of contradictions. And, uh, and so, uh, and this, this particular piece of work was the uh, symbol of my own university on its crest, but it was not the authentic, the picture, the painting uh, of the original work. And so as normal, curious people and academics, we undertook uh, the mission of trying to find out where the authentic piece of art was. There was a substitute, which for me was an insult. I mean, every time I looked at it, in the Ife Museum, I frankly felt like puking because I knew what the original was like. Beautiful piece of work, classic uh, uh, proportions and so on. Finally, we got information where it was. We got information uh, which we considered absolutely reliable about who had now the word stolen, stolen it out of Nigeria. So we went on a well, you wouldn't call it a normal mission of recovery, but we did what we could with the uh, facilities at our hand. And uh, it ended in a, a bathos because what we pursued into that country turned out to be a replica, not the original. So mud in our faces, but it was something we couldn't live on without doing. A celebratory insult. So, okay, so let me rephrase not a stolen piece of art, but you are recouping art or attempting to recoup art, the story of art that has been stolen, as you say, from the continent of Africa. For this is a story that's repeated many, many times. So, in your search for recuperating it, um, which took you, I mean, for those who don't know the story, read the story in, in the memoir because it took you all the way to Brazil and London. Uh, in search of this piece of art? Well, I had become some kind of collector also within my means. And why did I, how, how did I become a collector? I don't really believe in hoarding to start with. But watching, uh, growing up watching, and this included even some of my own colleagues, loot, 
uh, arranged the, um, the expatriation of works of art and uh, various covers. Sometimes when they were leaving, their, their suitcases would bulge with uh, pieces of treasured arts, which the Nigerian Museum had not acquired somehow. And so I began as, as, as a kind of uh, personal consolation in buying myself, acquiring a work of art here and there within my means. In addition, a work of art itself is not just a piece of uh, aesthetic work for admiration. It's, as I said, it's history, it's, it's race, it's, it's family, it's community. And seeing this, uh, this heritage, this bequest, this part of us just disappearing like that, and also additionally, even more insultingly, being disparaged by the self-vaunting religions of the world, Christianity and Islam, who condemn these works of fetishist pieces, primitive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. While they were taking it out, while they were uh, even quote unquote <laughs> legitimately uh, looting these pieces as compensation for like the, uh, the, um, the raid on Benin, for instance, which uh, the British claimed uh, was to, uh, after the raid, they then looted the palace and all the various uh, art uh, institutions. And so this was to compensate them for blistering the Benin kingdom. And so they took these works about, distributed them, sold them. Grew up. So I, I grew up with this history. Hmm. And then, uh, these these precipitates these are the precipitates of a people's spirituality, mm. and uh, in the process that meant even that, that spiritual network that bound the black people together was just being shredded to pieces. So this thing was beyond just a piece a piece of work to be admired. And so after that, in or not so much after that, in the midst of all that then to learn that this thing, this piece of work, which in fact, incidentally, it was uh, the image of the, one of the Nigerian stamps, I forget what denomination, for a long while. And to see this being advertised around the whole world as what the African genius has produced, it hurt. I'm explaining why there was no hesitation about by going on that mission. Okay, let's move from art a little bit further back in time to your childhood, which you raised slightly in that uh, story. Um, you are the son of an Anglican minister. I am the daughter of an Anglican minister. You're the son of a entrepreneur activist mother and your cousin Felakuti is the legendary Nigerian musician. Wonder if you can take us back to your childhood and tell us a little bit about what might have prepared you or shaped you to become the storyteller that you are. Well, I have inherited certain genes, obviously, uh, um, creative genes in the music direction, uh, the theatrical uh, direction. Uh, my my father was uh, quite a you know, small time musician. He played the um, what's it called the organ, um, and we have within the family uh, Christian converted Christians who transcribed musically Yoruba music of the Orisha, and sort of donated that music in a way to the Christian religion. Um, but throughout this street, especially one that ran through my grandfather, who was an out and out uh, Orisha worshiper to begin with, before the poor man was converted to Christianity. You know, he at least, I was able to observe him and to see his, his closeness to nature. He and his, his, his colleagues, friend, I, I saw a different a system of existence, of appreciation of phenomena from that of Christianity in which I was raised. And for some reason or the other, I preferred that right from childhood. So even though I was a chorister, 
uh, for some time. No, I had nothing against Christian music. I sang lustily with everybody else. But it didn't take long at all before I, I found myself alienated from that, uh, that religion. And, and in school, I thereupon, you know, repudiated quite early Christianity as um, a system of spirituality. I was able to relate to the spiritual in being outside Christianity. And finally, I jettisoned it altogether. So that's a background, very artistic, very in, in terms of uh, inheritance. Uh, and then I grew up, of course, in the atmosphere of storytelling, masquerades going through the streets, um, the poetry, Ijala, Yoruba poetry, et cetera, et cetera. So you could say that I already had uh, the silver spoon already stuck in my throat right from childhood. Well, you know, that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, many of the, the things that you've been already touching on, themes of hypocrisy with our earlier discussion about art and, you know, now bringing up music, a childhood where there was music, um, it all comes into your novel, your latest novel in some shape or form. So I want to just turn to that and, you know, focus on your latest novel, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth, which is an ironic title in itself. This is the first time that you have written a novel in 48 years. So this is your third novel. Um, but the themes that you explore in this novel are themes that are explored in so much of your canon of work, in your memoirs, in your theater in particular. Um, this book really made me think of your plays um, and revisiting them, especially Mad Men and Specialists. The novel is a savage satire of a novel. It's a whodunit of sorts. Um, there's the secret trade in body parts. And it's also the story of lifelong friendships. And as I was reading the novel, you know, for me, it's a novel that moves to the beat of Fela Kuti. And when I think of it in visual terms, because we are in the context of a museum, it, it made me think of um, Hogarth's painting of 16th century London, and then of Yin Kash Johnny Barry, more contemporary images. And it had a personal, particular personal resonance, as I've said to you, we were speaking yesterday, because I grew up in Joss, and Joss is one of the main locations for this novel. But I want to quote something that the novelist Ben Okri said about this novel in a recent review for The Guardian, and I quote, he says, this is a novel written at the end of an artist's tether. It has gone beyond satire. It is a vast dance macabre. Professor Shoinka, was this book written at the end of your tether? Ah, ben Okre, when I see him, I'm going to hammer his head because that particular quotation keeps cropping up and, and I can understand why. Um, and to some extent, it is true. It is true. I've written, I've explored this theme as you remarked, through various genres, including uh, poetry. Uh, in the cause of whose reading, I found myself uncharacteristically breaking down. It was as bad as that when I attempted to read the um, Ode to Chibok and Lea, uh, Lea of Dutch. I could not complete. So this thing has gone beyond mere poetizing. Uh, it's gone beyond fodder for creative transformation, for creative mauling, reconfiguring uh, of realities, uh, even beyond uh, a prospectus for survival. So Ben is absolutely spot on there. At the same time, however, um, it is not at the end of one's tether for the simple reason that uh, there's a challenge, I hope, implicit, embedded in it, 
quite obvious not to sleep better. It's really obviously, there's a challenge. And when there's a challenge, it means you are actually saying that this is not the end of the story. And that uh, it's sufficient to be able to hold up a distorting mirror in an unaccustomed way to a community of which one is a part and from whose existence one takes one's own definition has done for decades. And so that element of challenge, which I hope is apparent there, uh, it means that um, one hasn't really given up on the, on the nation, on the people, even if one thinks it's about time one bowed out. There is a Yoruba phrase so I don't know if I pronounced that well enough, but it's a phrase that you use in your memoir, um, You Shall Set Forth at Dawn. Maybe you can translate for, for those Yorubas who heard my accent and didn't quite understand, <laughs> or for the audience, what that phrase means and how it applies to you or doesn't. It's a phrase I've summoned to my, uh, to the end of my sanity uh, several times. And I've said, look, I've uh, labored along this line for so long, nothing really has changed and uh, I'm getting old. I've become old and yet nothing has changed. And so why should I despair? Isn't there a Yoruba proverb which says, which means literally when one gets um, to the elderly status, one seizes uh, conflict, one, one, one moves away from conflict. I've tried to apply that to myself numerous times. Uh, I found in the end that uh, I'm not quite as old as I feel. And also that there is my personal entitlement to a piece of that earth in which I was born. And that however degraded it is, I mean, the more degraded it is, the more I feel obliged to sanitize it to some extent, uh, to make it possible for me to continue to exist within it with a sense of honor, with a sense of uh, an element of contribution to his very survival. So I'm afraid that very wise, very wise saying uh, just, just never sat well on me, not for very long, unfortunately. Let me insist, let me stress this. I wish I could actually follow the wisdom in that proverb, that statement, that saying. I really, I really do wish I could. <laughs> so roughly translated, if we are older, we cease to indulge in battles, but that's not happening for you. You said you don't feel old. How old do you feel, Professor Shoenka? It's embarrassing, you know. <laughs> One should learn to be one's age and grow up gracefully. I'm almost ashamed to admit how old I am, given the things I still get into. No, I don't want to know how old you are. I want to know how old you feel. How old do I? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That mm. I, I don't, I'm not, I, I consider disgraceful that I don't feel my age. I can't put a figure on it. All I'm saying is that each time I recollect how old I am, I feel embarrassed. Okay, we will leave it at that. <laughs> but I want to talk for a moment about humor, Professor Shoyinka, because I know that in a lot of conversations around this book, this book is, is heavy and it's hard to read on so many levels. But as a fellow writer, I want to talk to you about your use of humor. You use all kinds of different humor from humor through the language, situational humor, the way that you capture characters, it's, you know, if we had longer, we would read passages of this novel. It is superb the way that you use humor. And of course, a lot of the humor is quite dark humor. But one little thing struck me, and maybe we can talk about this when you tell us a little bit about humor. 
you refer to the character Uriah Heep a couple of times, or at least this is a character that's in one of your character's minds. And this is a character from David Copperfield, Charles Dickens. It's a book that I read, or actually was read to me as a young child. And sort of this unctuous, sycophantic, awful character um, that is referred to in the novel that you've written and that characterizes a, a couple of the characters. Um, I'm curious as to when you first came across Charles Dickens yourself and how you think about humor in the, in, in the works that you write. First of all, I must um, uh, remind you, because I'm sure you heard me mention this somewhere before, that one of the authors, the main authors in my father's small library, he was a school teacher, headmaster, as you know, of course, was Charles Dickens. Side by side with the uh, Euripides Medea, you know, uh, which has left a lot of impression on me, and of course Charles Lamb, uh, uh, Bob Boiler of uh, Shakespeare's plays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Dickens, for me, is just one of the most unbelievable, remarkable uh, fiction uh, fiction writers the world has ever produced. I think grossly understated, the characters, the characterization. And one of them, which always stuck in my head, was Uriah Heep. What reason? I knew him. I could recognize him. From childhood, I always said, that's Uriah Heep, even <laughs> though I didn't say exactly Uriah Heep. Mm. With my siblings, each time Uriah Heep came to the house, you know, we made sure we were eavesdropping. <laughs> we were thought to be entertained, disgusted, uh, made to feel superior, uh, comparing him to other beings who flocked around the house and so on. So I knew, right? That's why he keeps coming up. And part of the problem of our society till today is that we have not yet tamed the Uriah heaps. They are all over the place. Very wealthy, very often very wealthy, even when they are poor. They're quite content to remain uh, impoverished, always subservient, because they knew they could rely on a daily bread by Uriah Heapism, whether to the immediate uh, uh, recipient or to any other one who happens to come along to displace that source of uh, livelihood. And Uriah Heap, they, they don't have to occupy our, our official positions. No, 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 no. In fact, they, they are the most dangerous people in the world because they'll also suck up to you. They will come to you, oh yes, we know what you're doing. We know what you're trying. You know, we actually take your side. We believe in what you're doing, you know. But you know, it's, you misunderstand this person. He's, he, you know, we know he tortures people uh, and so on, but you know, he's also mending the road. Uh, so, you know, go easy. Yeah. They're all over the place. So Uriah Heep <laughs> has been a companion uh, of our existence since childhood. I can see that. I, you know, I'm also smiling because I think um, David Copperfield is the only novel that I read as a childhood that I can recite a line or two from, from the novel. Uh, one of the lines, I don't know why, but it's the line that is, there is no greater disparity in marriage than the unsuitability of mind and purpose. So that's what stuck in, in my head <laughs> from, from a book that contains Uriah Heep. Yeah. Professor, the, the great writer, uh, James Baldwin wrote something in Notes of a Native Son and I want to read it and see if it resonates with you for Nigeria um, in the light of what you've just been saying. James Baldwin says, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Is that something that resonates with you for Nigeria? No. Uh, I tell you why. Uh, the kind of 
sense of national belonging and, and uh, appropriation, which even uh, the post-slavery generations are for the United States, is something which is missing in, uh, in Nigeria. We could have had it, it derails on uh, along the way for numerous reasons, but the sense of a cohesive entity to which one can dedicate not just mind but spirit, uh, something which I've observed with many of my colleagues, many people all over the world, even after civil wars, fratricidal, uh, internal butchering and so on, and they come back and they defend that entity. You can see it even in the way they sing their national anthems. They look at their faces, they, they have sort of, when they hear the national anthem played, you can see them retreat into their interior being. It's there, you can watch it. And in their various activities, their, um, their concession of posi you know, positivity, and of course, even the assembly of their criticism of the country is based on love. For me, Nigeria, at the beginning also, I had this sense, but I didn't realize I didn't have it. I accept Nigeria, I accept it as my workspace, as a bequest, became one way or the other, but it didn't come about in a way that would ever make me say, I'm ready to die for this nation. No, uh, there's always been something tacky, something unnatural, uh, contrived about Nigeria. And people can say what they like. They can shout from the top of the hills and the depths of the ocean, Nigerians I'm talking about, especially when they've been in power, when they're in power, and you use expressions like this nation, the, in, the uh, indivisibility of this nation is non-negotiable, et cetera, et cetera. I listen to them, I watch them. Some of them are those who contributed so deeply, so effectively in the disintegration that is happening to that nation. So I don't believe them to start with. And I look at my position in it, and I know that, yes, I will, the people in somehow I've arrived at a kind of dichotomy between people, humanity, and nation along the way. Maybe it's a long story, I could really short one. Maybe it was just a moment. But I'm more concerned about, I'm totally committed to the humanity within it. But that whole notion of Nigeria as something which one feels viscerally. I'm sorry, I lost that visceral connection ages ago, and I don't deceive myself about it. Hmm. It's, uh, I hear what you're saying, and it's hard to hear. And, you know, we're, we're speaking on the eve of Nigeria's 61st independence. I don't want to say celebration, but independence anniversary, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, at this, I mean, I, 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 you have me thinking about my own feelings about Nigeria, even though I've been out of the country for a long time. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. But the irony, hmm. the irony is this, that I can't stand people bad mouthing Nigeria. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah. I, rise, so, I yeah. rise to the defense of Nigeria when I hear people bad mouthing it. And I say, what about you? Was it in your country such and such a thing took place? Have you heard of this person in Nigeria? Don't we have Nigerians in NASA uh, producing uh, spare parts mm -hmm. for your uh, something? You know? I go to town for it. Yeah, it's you know, no, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So, you know what? Let's move momentarily from Nigeria to the rest of the world, because you have been a tireless 
campaigner for against tyranny and injustice, not just in Nigeria, but around the world. So going way back to your earliest play, I remember your Nobel lecture, you were um, talking about apartheid South Africa. That was a big thing for you. Um, you ended your Nobel lecture, you know, speaking to the world, how can you stand by and watch what's happening? Um, those who are familiar with your poetry, many people are most familiar with co telephone conversation. You know, you're sort of riling a little bit against British uh, housing discrimination and racism. You know, civil rights in America is something that you have you have spoken about, written about. And you've also always said that Af Africa for you is not limited to the continent. So, you know, you have your eye on the world. And as I'm thinking about the world today, the world is, an in, is, an in, is in an interesting state. Uh, that's probably an understatement. But something that I was pondering on as I knew I was going to come and speak to you was, you know, you grew up at a time of anti-colonial movements. And in a way, it almost looks like we've come full circle. We're still talking about anti-colonialism movements of sorts, taking down statues, renaming things. Uh, you went through the civil rights period in America. And, you know, in the last year or so, people keep talking about this, quote unquote, racial reckoning in America. So I wonder for someone of your youthful age, um, who has seen these movements before, does what we are experiencing now, does it seem the same or different from decades earlier? Oh, not just different, but dissociated. Sometimes it's difficult for me to find a continuum, but then of course it's there. We know it's there. Uh, and we know also of the positive lines of development, which have been embarked upon to pull Nigeria back from where it was being pushed, not where the head of it, so to push Nigeria back, pull Nigeria back. When I wrote my independence play, for instance, uh, in 1960, which is a play which was supposed to be the official play for independence, but it was removed, it was rejected, uh, because uh, the, those powers that be at the time felt it was too negative. That this was supposed to be a season of joy before, you know, fighting and winning. And the signs, the signs were already there. I already saw the signs of uh, a, a jettisoning of the, of the principles, the fervor that led to the independence. Uh, it was there when, as we met as students, the first generation leaders among them, we saw that they were only, all they understood about independence was they themselves stepping in the shoes of the colonists. That's all. They were already in the were Maori liberation slogans. So that independence was really, again, kind of challenge. So Professor Shoenka, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, this there appears to be a little bit of interference with your Wi-Fi. Could you just, um, could you just, you're fine, but maybe if you could just repeat just the, what you just said, the last two sentences or so. Yes, I, I was saying that the, the, that independence play, which uh, uh, the government at the time thought was too threatening, too negative, was actually a challenge. It was a, it was a positive statement. It, it, recognized and accepted an entity that deserved um, deserved to be developed, deserved to be amplified, heightened along its positive virtues. And therefore I recalled history to say, please take warning, even from your own history. It hasn't always been a smooth and a smooth uh, a passage of arms. And uh, that there are those ogres monsters waiting to drag this nation down. And I've confessed that I, uh, in my generation, at least part of the 
uh, which with which I, uh, I interacted in a really profound way. We we saw our mission as um, salvaging, as, as just liberating Africa. We didn't even think in Nigeria terms. So this is something which I think I don't stress sufficiently. But at the beginning, we didn't even think of Nigeria as not as a separate entity. Our sites were we're going to go down to South Africa to liberate sorry to liberate the uh, uh, settler colonialist um, Rhodesias and all those obscenities you know in, in that zone. And then suddenly along the way, at least I realized that uh, the expression charity becomes um, charity begins at home is not final one. And I saw the dangers inside our own uh, nation state, our own uh, nation space. And so the primary thing became going and confronting those who were obviously geared to make sure Nigeria, that thing, did not sell. This, is, this explains my interaction with the Black movement in the United States. Sixties and seventies, with the poets, the theatre people, Black is Beautiful movement, etc. Even that person in, uh, lectured in their schools all over the place. You know, uh, during that period when Africa was being presented to the to Black America, uh, to this America, Black uh, Africa was being presented as an alternative uh, material of knowledge of wisdom and of vision. That's why I interact with them so closely and brought back to Nigeria, my lectures and so on, the lessons of what was going on in the United States. Mm. That's why I interacted with the writers of South Africa. That's why in Nigeria we received the refugees. It wasn't just the government. I'm talking about institutions. I'm talking about universities. I'm talking about uh, uh, private uh, arts uh, clubs, et cetera, et cetera. We felt at one. Mm. It wasn't an empty form of rhetoric of an Africanism. No, we saw that Africa as one people, and that included Africa of it. I've never accepted in the recent separation by Sline Waters. Uh, in the Caribbean, uh, most of those, for me, those are pieces, those are slices of the African continent. Mm. Uh, and in many, many ways, which we're going to hear, uh, we're astonished, even collaborating with some governments in trying to seduce back to Africa some of the scientists, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some of the most brilliant uh, people there. An association was created under Sheikh Ante Diop of Senegal uh, to, to liaise, to bring up the, the world, the intellectual world of the African continent, mm. across the continent together, back to the African continent. Mm. So it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult for me uh, to, to see what, how all those dreams, all those I've just been uh, just jettisoned. Africa for me is not just the continent. I'm closer to the blacks of the Caribbean and the United States than I am to Africa North, the part. I call to the Africans of the diaspora than many uh, inhabited by uh, uh, in, uh, in help with the African continent. Uh, a geographical boundary is an accident. So, Professor Shoinka, unfortunately, Wi Fi is playing up a little bit. So, we're, I know, I noticed. We're catching, I noticed that. we're catching little snippets, but I'm just going to say a little prayer and hope that uh, it corrects itself. Um, but, you know, you've pointed to the interactions, the points of similarity, and the, you know the, that you have felt. Um, again, just always thinking about the dignity of human beings, wherever they may be, in the continent of Africa or across the the diaspora. 
I want to ask you one last question before we move a little bit um, and say that the friendships has always seemed to me to be something really important to you because we see this, we see this in your fiction, we see this in your nonfiction. Your latest novel has friendship at its center in a way. Um, you know, your, the, the last memoir you wrote, You Must Set Forth at Dawn, it felt in many ways like it was uh, a homage to Femi Johnson. And in fact, this novel is dedicated to Femi Johnson, Delegiwa, and Bolaige. And, you know, you've had so many interesting friendships across the years. I think of poet uh, Christopher Okigbo to the great scholar, um, Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr., who we had on this program, to your fellow Nobel laureates, Bertrand Russell, uh, Toni Morrison. And I wonder if you can indulge us for a moment um, and tell us a little bit about your friendship with Toni Morrison. But I'm going to say something before I ask you to speak. And again, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that your Wi-Fi has corrected itself. A few years ago, I had the very lucky opportunity of meeting Toni Morrison and speaking to her, interviewing her in her home. <clears throat> and just before we went to speak to her, I used her bathroom. And there are many amazing photographs in her bathroom, one of which was her with you. It was a lovely black and white photograph. And so I mentioned this to Tony as we sat down and I said, oh, you know, I've just seen one of my countrymen. You see my Nigerian pride. Um, I've just seen Professor Wale Shoyinka in your bathroom. And her response, and I'm going to do this verbatim how she responded. She said, oh yeah, we used to go to Paris and we'd go and have meetings and talk, elegant talk, solve world problems. And Soyinka always, you know, knew how to solve everything. And then the two of us together said, he still does. And then she responded by saying, yes, yes, in that voice he has like that. So there's a little snippet of the conversation that I had <laughs> with the great Toni Morrison. So in that voice that you have like that, can you tell us anything can you tell us a story about Toni Morrison? Well, first I came to Toni Morrison through her works. And I said, this is, this, this really is genius writing. I cannot recall when we first met it, because probably because when we met eventually, just like I knew her already, that we'd already met. But from the very first moment, we bonded. There's no question at all about that. And uh, I set about trying to bring her to Nigeria right away to meet other writers and so on and so forth. And uh, then each uh, would go out together. She, there's an expression, <laughs> there was, and she was responsible for an expression which left so, such an impression on me. She said, I'm going to take you out to this restaurant. I'm going to take you out to this restaurant cooking there, it'll knock your socks off. I've never heard that expression <laughs> in my life. I've never forgotten it. I said, what? She said, knock your socks off. Well, maybe because in uh, Africa, so we wear sandals most of the time. Who wears socks? We'll you will knock your sandals. We'll the gentry. Say, <laughs> you'll knock your socks off. And that image was something which came from her language. It was her language. And uh, it endeared me a lot more to her. And, more than that, however, was her sensibility towards the problems of the African continent. She was very much involved. She'd ask questions, sort of, how could that be? Question, how could that be going on? Kind of questions, genuine concern. And so I saw, um, as we as we say in Nigeria, she was another country woman, but a very close, very, very close one. And friendship for me uh, is what saves one's sanity. Mm. Friendship is seeking nothing, no advantage from the other person, but always knowing that it is there. Um, that is assistance, if you need it, and you simultaneously 
you know, are ready at any time. It's a, it's a very, it's almost a mystical thing. And uh, those who have experienced genuine friendship uh, should appreciate how very lucky they are because it's not often mm. that you can actually say that this is a genuine friend. And I've had some very, very deep friendships with people like the Femi Johnson whom you mentioned. Mm. Well, I knew this would happen. We run out of time. We always have some very special guests at the end of our program. And speaking of friendship, uh, we have uh, brought in one of your brothers. So um, Elizabeth will pull up um, four special guests that we have for you. And they will just have a, a moment or two to say something or ask you a question. We have the great Edwige Danticat, award-winning novelist, memoirist, short story writer, and like another guest of ours, she is also a um, MacArthur Genius Award winner. We have uh, Professor Harry Elam. He is president of Occidental College, professor of theater. He's a world-renowned August Wilson scholar, award-winning author and editor of numerous books. He also happens to be the husband of the amazing Professor Michelle Elam. And then we have your brother, as you can see, who's just come on, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., multiple award-winning filmmaker, scholar, institution builder, entrepreneur, prolific writer of many, many great books. I've got to stop because otherwise we won't stop with Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. And then we've got Meron Hadero, who is an award-winning short story writer and novelist. And she just won the 2021 AKA, AKO Kane Prize for writing, for African writing. And um, Professor Shoinka, you are a patron for this prize. So it is such a pleasure, you know, and I, and I have to say that some of these special guests <laughs> are, are, could be the next Nobel laureate, in my opinion. So, you know, that announcement will come out in a few weeks. Let's see which of our special guests might be that person. Um, I, we have a few minutes, we'll probably run over just a little bit, but I would like to um, start by going to Meron. Um, welcome. You may be- Hello. Yes, I think, I, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. It's, it's such an honor to speak with you. Thank you for your insights today and in your writing. Um, I was, I have so many things that I would love to ask, but I was struck by what you were saying about music. My sister is also a musician and I feel a strong influence uh, from music in my work. And I was just wondering if there's a piece that inspires you or that you feel has shaped your voice or your, your writing in particular. Traditional music unquestionably traditional Yoruba music, especially music from AKT, and also uh, music from Senegal, uh, mm -hmm. which has a kind of affinity to our music from the AKT uh, area. And then the, the Rara uh, mode of musical incantation, uh, from which, in my view, the present uh, rap, rap music actually evolved. It's a long story, and I hope we can meet one day and try and track some of these uh, modes, musical modes. It's actually very fascinating uh, for, as a consumer, for me to detect these all the time. But music definitely has played a very important role. In fact, I sometimes say I'm a frustrated musician. Meron, I wanted to add that um, Professor Shoyinka, I don't know if you know this, wrote the music and lyrics for an album that was released in the 1980s. So you can check that out. I will do that. <laughs> so I'd like to move now to Professor Harry Elam. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm honored to be with you and thank you for including me and uh, Professor Shoyinka, it's great to see you. Uh, that's like many years ago when you visited Stanford, but, uh, and I wanted to ask you about theater, um, actually theater and film. I heard that Ebony Life 
a Nigerian media company, the biggest one, I think, um, is going to do your play uh, and set it as, as a film, um, Death and the King's Horsemen. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Are you involved in and in thinking about uh, uh, this incredible play that has been so seminal and so important to so many? Well, it's, um, it's very gratifying when any time I'm approached, of course, especially on Death and the King's Horseman, uh, about obtaining the rights and so on. And there have been a number of efforts. Right now, I believe it's actually in rehearsal for a kind of Netflix um, film. Uh, I'm not involved in that production, uh, but uh, I understand the rehearsal is going well, and we just try to see the production. But I have a feeling that it's one of those plays, I just get that feeling, it's one of those plays which again and again, will resurface in one cinematic form or another. There have been attempts to turn it into musicals, I turn that down, Flat. <laughs> After I'm dead here, so you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see here it as a music, as, as a, a musical drama, that's a possibility, but not as a musical. But film, yes, um, I'm open to any suggestions because it doesn't end just with one. Thank you. you know, I'm Thank great to see you, by the way. Yeah. Now, that is one surprise. That <laughs> two, two surprises. So surprise me some more. <laughs> Well, we have a delightful surprise with the wonderful Edwige Danticat. Um, Edwige, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry about my, my beach <laughs> image. Well, After all this time, we should have fig I should be able to figure this out. But uh, I, my question, it's a wonderful pleasure. It's so wonderful to see you and, and all our friends here. And as Sarah mentioned, this is your first novel in 50 years. And you told The Guardian that this is your gift to Nigeria. And I wonder, I imagine that this Niger the Nigeria of this moment is more ready to receive this, your gift this time around. But how would you compare the experience of writing this novel to, to your first two novels and also your plays and poetry? Oh, no. I, I... I hate the word development because it's never accurate. For me, everything, I like to think at least that everything I've written is different. Uh, so all I can say about it is that it's different. But I must say that in writing this novel, uh, I have been in a more, let me use that word, yeah, we're we'll, we'll run away from it, a more vengeful mood than in uh, the other novels. Um, yeah, it's too complicated, but I, I think when I, it's the kind of gift which one runs down the throat of the receiver. Say, if you don't like it, let it choke. Those are powerful words. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Edwige. And, you know, I've saved your brother for the last. Um... <laughs> Um, Skip Gates, um, Professor Henry Lewis Gates, Jr. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been riveting. Um, you asked Wally questions that uh, I'd never heard him uh, uh, ask before, and the answers were fresh and um, enlightening. I love the story of the attempt to uh, reappropriate the classic work of art from Brazil. I know that story. I've heard it at the time, I've heard it 20 times, but I never heard it better than I heard it today. And it's true. <laughs> it's one of this man's not in a Brazilian prison. I want everybody to know that. But Wally, my very serious question is, what was the name of the restaurant that Tony Morrison took you to, to knock your socks off, A, and what wine did you drink when your socks were being knocked off? <laughs> First thing I have to tell you is that you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> this is pay, payback time. Friends don't do that. Because <laughs> I appeared as a mystery guest on your program. Now you, you forced your way into this one. I'll deal with you later on. Now, your question. You know something? Tony Morrison's idea of sock knocking uh, was uh, the restaurant was a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> and, I, and I told her. 
Number one, they didn't use peppers. That was the main problem. It was an African restaurant. And the food was probably good. And academically, yes, but no peppers. Now, skip. Can you imagine somebody knocking my socks off without any peppers? Without no, any I can't. For shame. For shame. For shame. Well, Tony fell down on that. But at least she left me the expression. So I'm grateful to her. You know, on Monday, Wally and I will be having dinner in New York. And Wally, I want you to uh, pick uh, the, the restaurant that Tony should have picked. And I want to unveil something, if you can bear with me, Sarah. I've never shown this on camera before, <laughs> but in that cabinet, that brown door is full of nothing but chili sauces introduced to me by my professor at the University of Cambridge, Wally Shoyinka. I'm going to unveil it right now. Nothing but chilies. <laughs> this one, this one. Uh, I think I know that one. Yes, 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 yes. Akabanga. Akabanga from Rwanda. This is nuclear I fuel. I get, you, I get a regular supply now. You gave it to me. You brought it to me. It's oh, burning my hand. Yes, it's burning my fingers, um, <laughs> Harry, right now. My, I'm on fire. <laughs> I was. It, it has I, triggered everyone, off the alarm in luggage at um, um, in some um, uh, airports, at some airport, in which the person <laughs> carrying it was detained. That's yeah, true. let me my interpret. Let me tell you. Later. Yep. Let me tell you. It's, it's triggered off some alarms in other locales. <laughs> you, you too. <laughs> and in my house, I'm in the kitchen of my house, as you can see, right under me is a wine cellar. It is dedicated to my professor who introduced me to wine. You know, when Harry and uh, Marilyn and um, uh, Edwidge, my generation didn't drink wine. I'm the class of 73. We got inebriated more vaporous ways. <laughs> so I go off to Cambridge and Chilinka's introduced me to wine. Wine and chili peppers and Indian food all at the same time. So my mouth is on fire. I'm getting drunk. I'm uh, trying to understand these chilies. And that's the real education. That's the real story of our right. friendship. It is without right a doubt. On. Right on, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, Wait, we'll see. You look fine, and I love your your novels. Just fabulous. I read it in in manuscript. I had the pleasure of delivering it to uh, his mutual friend, my fellow classmate from Yale, Errol McDonald, his editor at uh, Pantheon. And one thing I do want to say about Death and the King's Horseman. Well, there was an article in the New York Times about the production at Netflix that Harry was alluding to, and I was one of the two guest. I was doing uh, supervision, as they say, at Cambridge with Wally on African literature. And he told me he couldn't see me for a week. He had something he had to do. And in that week, we just said, I can't see you until I uh, let you know. And in those days, Sarah, there were no telephones in the rooms at Cambridge. You had to send a note. So I, I got a note from him saying, OK. And I went to see him. And he asked if I would be available with another student. And he had readers come up from London. And they read this play. I was, I sat there with this other uh, student who was from Nigeria. And we were the first people to hear Death and the King's Horseman spoken out loud, even before I could read it. And so I very much think of it as quote unquote, my play, because I think a thousand years from now, when they're reading Hamlet, they'll be reading Death and the King's Horseman. It is one of the great plays of the 20th century. I without, totally agree. Without a doubt. It's true. Well, on that very important note, I am so sorry to have to bring this conversation to a close. I know, Professor Shoenka, it is late, late where you are right now. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you to all our very special guests. Thank you above all, Professor Shoenka, for who you are, what you do, what you write. You are a legend and a gift to all of us. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shoinka, for this incredibly rich conversation. And I'm so glad that we could treat you with um, friends and colleagues who are so excited to see you. Uh, I do have a few uh, announcements that I want to make before we close. Um, I want to let everybody know that MOAD has an African book club um, that meets monthly, and our October selection um, is Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth. So um, please purchase a copy of the book from your local independent bookstore. MOAD's bookstore would be ideal. And we'll meet on Sunday, October 24th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. on Zoom with host Faith Adiele to speak about this incredible book. I also want to thank the San Francisco Public Library for um, co-presenting today's program. And we have two more programs coming up that MOAD and the library are collaborating on. So please check those out as well. If you are inclined to support MOAD, of course, we would love to have a donation from you. You can text that by texting 56512 and typing MOAD SF and then following the link to donate, or you can just go to our website at moadsf.org slash donate and make a donation. We would also love to hear your feedback about today's program. So um, you can scan this QR code and it will pop up a virtual program survey. It will also come up when you close your uh, this Zoom, it'll be on your browser. So please take a, a minute or two to fill out the survey and give us your feedback. We'd love to hear what you thought. Finally, we'd of course like to thank our sponsors. Um, funding for today's program has been provided by California Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. And we're always grateful to our support from Peggy Woodford Forbes for this program series, Conversations Across the Diaspora, hosted by Sarah Laripo Manika. Um, and stay tuned for future iterations of this series. Thank you all so much. And please have a wonderful afternoon, evening, night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>